Hello, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. And folks, guess what's back? It is Tuesday morning left guard time with Jeremiah Searles. That is right. We are going to be doing it once again every Tuesday ish, all season long. At least weekly, it will definitely happen. Sometimes uh, things get in the way, but mostly on Tuesday. Jeremiah, how is your summer? How you been? What's going on, man? It's been good, man. You know, August was a nice break. You know, the agency is full up and swing and rolling, and we're cooking with gas now, which is great to get back into that. You know, we had a second rounder and a fifth rounder this year in the previous draft, so really helpful there. Um, our second rounder is actually going to start for the Giants, John Michael Schmitz at center. Um, and Evan Hall, the running back from Northwestern, drafted by the fifth to the Colts, is going to get a chance to start with Jonathan Taylor and Zach Moss being out. So really good opportunities for our young guys. And then obviously our guy Cordell Volson up in uh, Bengal country still getting after it. So, you know, it's been a great, great year for the agency so far. I'm really excited to keep that going. Uh, Husker Stadium, Husker football is in full swing now, unfortunately. So got to get back into the Saturdays are for pain and sadness type of uh, type of mindset there after what happened up in uh, Gopherville last week. But overall, great summer. Uh, we added a new addition to the family since I think we did our last show. So I have three kids now. So chasing after all them. But I also got snipped. So no more kids. So super excited. Maybe TMI. But, you know, it's something I'm excited about that I have no more children on the way. Definitely TMI, but uh, also, <laughs> show you know, hot, Matt. Uh, not you're not the only one of uh, men of a certain age that I know who have gone down that route. So every, everybody speaks highly of it. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that that procedure was more fun than watching the Huskers play against the Gophers oh gosh, uh, the other day. Not exactly a great start to the Matt Rule era, I would not say. I was there. I went up to the game. I was in the stadium and right after we fumbled, I was like, hmm, I think I've seen this movie before. I'm pretty sure I know how it and how it ends. And sure enough, you know, costly turnovers, turnovers in the red zone. You know, I will say this. I'm excited about where we're at. I'm not sure how good of a gopher team that is. You know, I think that that defensively, they got some players. I mean, obviously Tyler Newbin is fantastic in the back end, you know, but I, they don't have Mo Ibrahim for the first time in 20 years. So trying to figure out who's gonna be a quarterback, but that, that young QB they have up there, he can spin it. Now he had some pretty cool throws on the run angle throws, and he's got some legs to him. So I think that offense is probably going to run through nine. Yeah. He's got uh he's got kind of that sidearm type of throw, yeah. but also you can't throw an interception in the red zone like he did anyway. But uh, this would also assume that people would have watched that game, which I'm not hundred percent sure that anyone did. Uh, so we'll just move forward and we'll see. I mean, you can't judge Matt rule just getting there. It does take time for him to put his stamp on the program, but it was absolutely classic Nebraska <laughs> losing a one score game. They are the anti 2022 Vikings. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to all those one score games, games so let's let's start to dive right in you know where we have to go with this but first we got to play the intro that we have not yes. played uh in some time so off oh. we go I always forget about the picture. I always do. And then it just immediately brings a smile back to my face. Oh, I and love uh, it. for those listening just on audio, um, it's you in high school giving a thumbs up yes. and <laughs> big old 17 year old grin, Jeremiah Searles. I'm going to say at that point that people would not maybe have expected you to make the national football league. Uh, mm. it, you needed a little bit of a transformation there and in, in yes. order to go from that to, to what you became. <laughs> so why, what, what, I mean, this has been a, a fascination for Vikings fans for the entire off season is the fact that they ran back all five offensive linemen. And I think that there's something to be said for having five offensive linemen back as opposed to trying to place new players into an offensive line all the time. So maybe you could speak to that. Like if there's, if, if there's a reason this works, it has to be because their chemistry is, is good from last year. So they bring back Bradbury. They don't make changes at the guard position, but how do we think this is going to go? And what could that mean that they had everybody back? Yeah, you know, the biggest thing we talk about all the time is you want to develop young O-linemen, right? That's what you want to do. You want to have a chance to let them go in there and develop, but you want to let them develop under the same coach, under the same scheme, the same calls, right? So that they're truly just developing physically and getting more comfortable. I think year two under Chris Cooper, year two under uh, KOC, 
you know, all those things play a huge factor into having that chemistry and that cohesion where you're now able to put more on their plate because you're not worried about, does this guy know the offense or does this guy know the snap count or whatever it may be. All those guys should be so comfortable with all of the scheme and everything that now it's just really honing in on the certain techniques that coach Cooper wants really honing in on the certain like against this look or that look, what are the wrinkles, right? And having confidence that you can call anything in the playbook at any time, something you installed in week one, you can call in week nine, even though you haven't practiced it because these guys have done it before over and over and over again between OTAs and training camp and whatnot. Like you're just much more comfortable as a play caller. You're not worried about like, hey, if I, if I have to get to this play or if I have to get to this protection, does the right guard know what we're doing, right? Like, so from that standpoint, it's great. Now, we need to see big jumps from the guard positions. You know, Ezra Cleveland, I think he kind of is what he is, right? He's a proficient left guard, but you need to see a big jump in year one to year two in Ed Ingram, right? And I think you do. You usually see giant jumps in rookies, right? First year, they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants, not really sure what's going on, trying to keep their head above water. But, you know, you go into year two – and you really start to see what guys can become. How do they treat the offseason? Did they get bigger, faster, stronger? Is the, the game slow down for them? Like all those things are really going to be important. I think Ed Ingram's going to have to take that big jump. You know, he took a lot of scrutiny last year as a rookie. That happens, right? But that means that he's going to come out and be under the microscope even way more than he was last year because people are going to want to see that from him. So I think having year two with Coach Cooper, all those guys back together is going to pay dividends, you know, but we really, they have to go out and earn it. Yeah, and I think that what one thing that's hard to figure out is the offensive line coach's impact. I think you need multiple years for that. And uh, we we saw Rick Dennison in and how he impacted the run game, and he's like legendary for that. But then when he wasn't coaching, then it was Phil Rauscher, and then the guys are having to change who's coaching them, and then it's a totally different system last year with uh, Chris Cooper coming in. So even just understanding how he wants things done and what he's trying to teach, uh, I think is good for these players and the experience of Ed Ingram. And I do think that there's something to Ezra Cleveland having another year playing left guard after having to play tackle in college, right guard is a very chaotic start to his career. I think that's the most like positive way you could try to spin it is, Hey, maybe you got this guy back and like the year two jump and so forth. I do think they showed their cards a little bit though, when they brought in Dalton Reisner for a visit of like, okay, we're a little concerned about this and uh, the way that it's going with the guard position. I don't know if it was right or left guard, but the fact Ingram played in a preseason game kind of to me indicated that uh, they weren't too thrilled with the way it was going and maybe wanted to send a message by putting him in to a preseason game. Now you can't fix it unless you diagnose it. So after watching it all last year, what is it that could improve that would equal the jump? Because I think from a physical perspective, Eng Ingram is a huge guy and he, I think he has strength. And, and at times he looked like a good run blocker to me, but in pass protection, there were just too many huge misses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the biggest thing you talk about a huge miss, the death of an offensive lineman, especially an in interior are the quick beats, right? Getting beat quickly. It's how Aaron Donald had 20 sacks that year, right? He's beating dudes off the rip, right? Right away. And so as an offensive lineman, as you grow and develop, you have to understand it's better to survive and die a slow death than it is to try and like, let me just get my hands on this guy and rough him up. Right. And that just takes time with learning that, you know, he played at LSU, he played against good players, but they're werewolves every single week, right? Every single week, like you're going up against one of the, arguably the best players on the team, right? The three techniques in the NFL are evolving to become game changers, game wreckers. Right. So I think that for him, he has to understand patience and technique. Right. Understand, hey, I got to trust my technique. I got to trust my set. I got to trust my hands so that if I throw my hands and I'm not all over the place, this dude's not swimming and screaming up into Kirk's face. Right. Or if he swipes my hands, I had good feet so I can try and push him by the pile or or widen the pocket or those type of things. And he just has to limit the the quick beat. Right. And I think Ezra Cleveland did that. I mean, we, we, we talked about him as a rookie, too. We were like, man, this dude's getting beat like off the rip. Right. Like DeForest Buckner was just running right through him like he was standing still. But as you've seen, he started to understand, like, I'm a big, strong guy. Let's make this dude run through me instead of trying to have him play an edge, right? That was the biggest thing as an old lineman is don't allow them to get to your edges. If they beat you, make them go through you, right? You're 300 and plus pounds. It takes time to push that backwards. But if you allow them to play half a man and they're playing 150 pounds and they're able to get moves and get outside, 
it's a lot easier for them. So I think the biggest thing is just having more trust in his ability to pass protect, trust in his hands, and understanding where his help is. Hey, am I sliding to the tackle? Am I sliding away? Like understanding how to use my help to my advantage so that I can make this defensive lineman go somewhere that he doesn't want to go, right? Make him play me, not me play him. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, I did a story about Brian O'Neill, and I think I called it like the old bleep moments that make Brian O'Neill because even when he gets beat, he doesn't like he finds a way to get a hand on a guy to to push a guy off balance to just get enough and last year there were way too many times and from both of them really where there wasn't enough there was actually nothing uh, that, that they they didn't even get hands on guys and i think a big part of it was identification uh, because when you are a defense going up against the vikings you know a couple of things number one is that Christian Derrissaw is awesome and Brian O'Neill is awesome. So of course you're not going to stop rushing people over them, but your plan isn't probably to go after them because they're not the weak points in the offensive line. It's the inexperienced interior. So what we saw all the time was these stunts and twists and blitzes that were just targeted at these guys. And uh, there was a lot of times where it was like, Oh, was I supposed to, did you have the, what happened there? And I know that, you know, there's pre-snap communication, but there's also identifying it after the snap because defenses are good at showing a lot of different stuff and then sending something else. And I think that if there's anything that's going to show us whether he can improve or not, it's how he handles those mm. because he's had a year to see them. He's had a year to study them. And if you still don't understand what's going on there, and I know some people get beat sometimes, but if you're getting beat all the time, then it's going to be very hard to improve because that, Cal like that strategy against you is not changing. Like that's going to be the, the way that teams attack this year as well. Right. And, and the number one reason for that too, is because what frustrates Kirk cousins, the most pressure right in his teeth, right? That's been since he entered the league, that's been what really gets him rattled. That's what gets him on his toes is when he has a big werewolf in his face, breathing down on him and he can't see down the field or where he wants to go, which is why you saw teams like the giants just line Dexter Lawrence up and say mush, right? Like run. Right? And you're going to see a lot more of that. And then you create the chaos. You go through the twists and the TTs and the NTs. And going back to what we kind of said earlier, that should help having the fact that all three of them have spent all off season together. Like right last year, he came in as a rookie he was battling for that spot. So he didn't really just roll with the ones the whole time, right? He was with the ones, then the twos. And then all of a sudden season came. It's like, okay, now you're a one. Right. He's had a full off season to prepare with that one group and understand, hey, where how does Garrett set like this? Right. If we're setting this way, does Garrett set back and off? Does he set up on the line of scrimmage? Or hey, if I'm sat passing this off with O'Neal, how does he do it? Right. Or how does Oli do it? Right. He has all these chances to figure out because of just the reps that he's been able to do it over and over and over again. That that's where I talk about when the game's slowing down. That's what it means. That's where it's like, okay, I trust that I don't have to physically watch this dude as I pass him over to the center, right? I can trust that if I use my hands and throw him to the center, I can now get my eyes tracking back to the looper coming across, right? That's the trust that you have with the guys inside where you don't have to physically like, okay, is he there? Okay, yes, he's there. Now move, right? Those are half seconds that are causing you to get beat versus just having that trust and that feel and that cohesion with that middle three to pick up those stunts and allow Kirk to stand back there for only two and a half seconds, right? He's really good at getting the ball out. And like we talked about, Kirk's in a contract year. Kirk's not going to stand back there and take smacks, right? Like he's going to get the ball out. And so we have to make sure we give him the time. We give him that ability to do that because when he does, good things happen. Well, if I say, like we talked about, we haven't done a podcast in months, but we have talked at other times. Yes. So we, we did have we maybe have that discussion. Uh, but uh, so here's the question, I guess, fundamentally. I thought they had to bring back Garrett Bradbury because when you looked at the other options, uh, I don't know who is better than he was, but these guards, there's no parachute here. Uh, Chris Reed has been hurt for the entire training camp. He's not ready to go to start the season. I think he's a serviceable player that uh, maybe if he's healthy, you could bail on Ed Ingram if you have to, or Ezra Cleveland, if you feel like you have to, that it's collapsing and you end up in a Drew Samia situation where you've just got to do something else. Uh, but they really didn't give themselves any other parachute or any competition for Ed Ingram. The most competition they had was bringing in Dalton Reisner for a day to show him the facility. And, and that's it. 
Uh, Rise are still out there, by the way, which is I weird. And so. yeah. I don't really know what the deal is. Maybe just wants too much money or doesn't like football. Like, I don't even know. I I mean, it happens sometimes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, a, a Vikings fullback stopped playing football and now does Dungeons and Dragons on Twitch. I'm not even making that up. Like, that's, <laughs> that's so some some guys like different things. But um, or he just is is digging his heels in and waiting till somebody gets hurt. That could be the thing. But should they have done something else other than just bringing them back with Blake Brandle as the main backup guard? I thought they should have drafted an interior guy. You know, I felt like that was a position we talk about. You want to develop, you want to grow, bring in a rookie that Chris Cooper can say, you are mine, right? You are mine and I will mold you and I will shape you how I want you to be and how I want you to come in and compete for the starting spot or become the starter in a year or two or whatever it might be. And I'm not talking about like should draft one in the first, right? Like take a guard in the fifth, take a guard in the sixth. Right, Take a developmental type guard that you can come in and you can find those guys, those diamonds in the rough that turn into really good serviceable backups, role players, or eventually even starters. You know, So I would like to see them bring in some young talent on that. I don't think we had the cap room to bring in a, a starting quality guard. Right, like I think it, it really comes down to, you can say all the live long day, like why didn't we go do this or why didn't we go do that? It costs money. It costs money to go get caliber players that are ready to plug in and, and be an upgrade from where you're at. Versus you're talking about two guys that are on rookie contracts, right? I mean, Ezra's still on a rookie contract, correct? This is last year, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, so Ezra's on, a, Ezra's on a rookie contract. Ed Ingram's on a rookie contract. Those guys combined don't cost what one high quality starting guard costs in the NFL these days, right? And so you have to think about it from that. They're spending money elsewhere. They're getting ready to pay Jefferson. They just had to pay TJ Hawkinson. They didn't have the cap room to go out there and spend it on that position, which you and I on the podcast on we've talked about, like that's kind of been the MO for what the Vikings have done for a long time is that's the position that seems to suffer at times, but you can say we need upgrades and all the things, but if you can't pay for it, it's not going to happen. It's not a charity, right? The NFL is not a charity guys play for what they're paid. Well, and I also think that if you're talking about overall investment, they have a sec a second contract for Bradbury, a first round pick ported to him and second round picks into the other guys. So this isn't exactly the Spielman approach, which was uh, who wants to make eight hundred thousand dollars and come get destroyed every week? Uh, I mean, at least we're talking about highly talented players, high draft picks who have not reached their potential so far. And I think what Bradbury showed us was that there's always potential to improve for alignment after a couple of seasons. But the hard thing about that is you don't know if that's ever coming. So you could sort of talk yourself into, oh yeah, like the, they'll progress and they'll just have this linear progression and get better each year. But it wasn't even that way for Bradbury. The dude was benched in 2021 for Mason Cole. And then the next year he has the best year of his career. Like sometimes this just happens and maybe it's scheme or maybe he just ha said my NFL career is not going to last if I don't like do something else this off season. It's hard to know. Uh, and it's hard to know whether these guys are going to take a step forward. I guess if I was still trying to project, I would say it's going to be problematic, but even if it's less problematic, just even by a little, that's a big improvement over mm -hmm. what they had last year. Now on the defensive line, We've talked a lot about Brian Flores blitzing the hell out of everybody. And that's been super fun to watch in training camp because normally you don't see that in training camp of a guy just blitzing his own quarterback over and over and over again. But the, the actual trenches, when you lose the Darius Smith and you lose Delvin Tomlinson and are replacing them with Kyrus Tonga and Dean Lowry, I think that that leaves a lot of question marks to be had about whether Tonga can hold it down when he's asked to play all the time, how much is left for Dean Lowry, who drifted off a little bit from his production in the previous year. Uh, and there's only in my mind, so much that can be taken care of by just blitzing people. But I think the swing man here is bringing back to Neil Hunter. I mean, if the, if he wasn't here, I'd be saying, I don't know, maybe you should just trade Kirk. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Like, how are you going to pressure anybody? But with him there, and you can look at it, I think, through a little more of a rosy light than if he had decided or they had decided to trade him. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have a, a pass rusher that can win in a one-on-one -on -one battle 60%, 70% of the time, he's going to take a lot of attention, right? And Flores is going to use him in a way of like, let's rush Daniil off the right and blitz off the left, right? Because then you have to make a decision. 
do I slide into the blitz to pick up the blitz with my O line, and then I put one on one matchups with Daniel Hunter, or do I slide my my way to Daniel Hunter to get a, a double team on him and allow my running back to then have to come into the protection scheme and have to ask him to protect, right? So offenses are going to get put in a bind based off of that of kind of pick your poison, right? Because when you are playing aggressive defense, right? I think about like the Wink Martindales of the Giants, right? Guys coming all over the place. You have to figure out: Do I who do I want to who do I want to put my bets on, right? And usually it's the O line, right? You don't want to put tight ends and running backs in protection. That's not what you want to do because it's just not a winning formula. So usually it's like, okay, let's slide our O lineman into the blitz, pick it up, and then hey, right tackle, left tackle, earn your money, right? Earn your money. And when you have a guy like Daniel Hunter who has been so productive when he can stay healthy, get to the quarterback on a consistent basis, then everything else helps. Now I do think. I'm big on the idea of Brian Flores blitzing because we have to create pressure. I think so many times last year we sat there watching going, okay, he's going to stand in his five area bubble. No one's going to get around him. And I don't care who that is. He's going to be able to deliver a football, right? I think we, I think he watched that Flores watched that last year. All Vikings fans watched that like no more, none of that. And so I do think he's going to come out super aggressive and get after guys. But a lot is going to be asked of Davenport. A lot's going to be asked of um, Daniel Hunter to create pressure and win one-on-one -on -one matchups so that you can blitz the other side. Davenport is a really interesting swingman to this defense because his – Numbers would suggest that the man has always found ways to pressure quarterbacks and some years he sacks them and some years he does not sack them. But at very least, like every pressure is an impact. I mean, if you go to the PFF numbers and look at when a quarterback is pressured, I mean, you're talking about the best quarterbacks in the league quarterback rating drops from 105 to 78 or something like that. When they're pressured, there's almost nobody. I think Josh Allen is kind of the exception to this, but almost nobody is consistently above average while they're pressured. So if Davenport can even just pressure the quarterback, like that's real value there. And if he gets five sacks, seven sacks, whatever, uh, that's good for them. But also he's never played more than I think 500 and something snaps. And now they're going to ask him to play this outside linebacker type position, move inside on some third down stuff, put DJ Wanham out there. I think it could either be this great find and Brian Flores getting the most out of a player, which I, I lean that way, having seen training camp, or it could be, well, you signed a guy that just played 500 snaps again. It was kind of banged up and didn't really produce what you thought. If he gives them half of what Zadarius gave them last year and they can fill in the gaps with blitzing, they could create a lot more pressure than I think they did last season. Yeah, and, and you're right. You know, those pressure numbers, though they might equivalent to sacks, but pressures in the first and the second quarter, those add up into the fourth quarter, right? When you can knock a quarterback down a few times or you hit his arm funky or whatever it might be, like it, it makes quarterbacks start thinking more about the rush than it is the, the routes, right? And so, yes, we love the sacks. We love when the guys do the sack dance and the whole bit. But anytime you can affect the quarterback's throw or get him off his spot or get him moving around, that's a win because those things add up over time. It allows you to also fill weak points and pressure points of, okay, where is this offensive line weak at? Where can we take advantage of it? Hey, Davenport's killing this dude on the left. Let's blitz off the right, right? That's the kind of stuff that allows you to have so many bags of tricks that Flores defense is of guys run all over the place. Whoever's kind of feeling it that game, whether it's Davenport or whether it's Daniel Hunter or maybe Wanham's figuring it out, you know, it's all of a sudden you're like, okay, those two guys are figuring out, let's attack the other side. Right. And I think that's what Flores wants when you talk about moving guys around from outside linebacker to inside is let's just put guys in their best positions to win. Maybe it's not the best position that like, oh, we don't want him to play a thousand snaps at three technique. But if he's having a really good game against this guard, let's keep him inside and kick someone outside. Right. I think Flores is very flowy with that, you know, watching back to his defenses in Miami. He had Christian Wilkinson that played five technique, nose guard, like he had Chubb. Like these guys were just all over the place, and it just never let the O-lineman get a great beat on anyone. And I think that's going to be a lot more of – it's going to look like chaos at times for us as fans where we look like, what is happening? But, like, it's going to be organized chaos for them, right? If they can all be on the same page, they're going to create a lot of confusion for offensive lines up front. Uh, I want to ask you about what it's like to practice against Daniil Hunter because you have, but also – are you aware that if I'm adding it up correct, there's only three Vikings left who you played with. Yes. That's only CJ Ham, Harrison Smith, and Daniel Hunter. And that's it. 
they will soon potentially soon be extinct for uh, Vikings players that you played with. Everybody else uh, has been turned over, which is just kind of crazy because you haven't been out of the league very long. Yeah, I mean, what, 17 was my last year there, right? I mean, so it, it wasn't that long, but such is nature of the NFL, right? Guys get old, guys move on, and there's this huge youth movement right now of trying to get younger in the NFL, right? I think the Colts are the ones that have, like, one player over the age of 30 or something crazy like that. Yeah, but, I mean, Daniil Hunter, I remember when he came in as a 20-year-old. Right? He was 20 years old when he got in the league to the point where he couldn't even buy the rookie dinner booze because he wasn't old enough to pay for it. Right. And to watch where he was and know how special he was going to be and to see the career that he's had, like it's to no surprise of anyone that was in that building when he showed up as a rookie. Yeah. I mean, the w one thing about Hunter is every year we've done this dance with his contract. And so then you're always asking, is he really as good as Miles Garrett or is really as good as this the guy, the other guy? But what I've always been just so impressed with him is that he seems to continually get better and he is the least dramatic or look at me superstar player in the league. When you look at his numbers, and then this even goes against the run as well, where he's fantastic, run or pass, PFF grades, pressures, sacks, whatever metric you want to use. The guy is elite, and yet he is like the quietest, just always kind of a part of that locker room. And I, it was, a, I don't know, a little bit odd to me that they didn't decide to put down all the money for Daniel Hunter to keep him long term. And maybe that's just part of their strategy, that they want as much flexibility as possible. You've got the Justin Jefferson extension looming at some point. But if they had done it, I would have thought, like, this is a guy who you want in the ring of honor. This is like, a, you, you're never going to feel bad about having Daniel Hunter as a Viking for life. Right. And I mean, I think everyone wants that, but at the same time, age plays a factor, right? Age plays a factor. And especially he's going to play every snap this year, right? Like they're going to ask a ton out of him. I mean, they paid him what they paid him. They're like, all right, earn it. Right. Like he's going to get asked to do a lot this year and they'll see, Hey, can his body hold up? Right. He's got the neck issue. He's had the other kind of, um, lingering stuff like but if he can hold up you're right he deserves every dollar that he gets especially if he goes out and has a double digit sack year this year like he can all right here's what i want to know so it has been a while since we have podcasted uh you must have been you know keeping some takes about the vikings and the nfl just pent up in your football -y soul you must have been spending all these months do, you know out there just like thinking of takes and and, and they must have been bursting out of your brain so I want to know what some of those takes are. I want to know some of these, some predictions, some, some hot takes, who's going to win the Super Bowl, who you think is going to be overrated. Like, what do you got for him? What have, what have you been holding on to all summer long? Vikings takes or NFL hot takes? It, it could be either one. If you want to get out the Vikings takes first, uh, uh, we could do that. I think Justin Jefferson breaks 2,000 yards receiving this year. I think, That's a hot one. That's I a think, hot one. I think, I think he breaks 2,000 yards receiving this year based off of everyone in this day and age is holding out for their contract, right? I'm not practicing. I'm not doing this. And, and I don't hold it against him. Get paid. Go do your thing, big fella. But that's a guy that's been acting like a true pro, knowing he's going to get paid what he gets deserved because of the way he works, the chemistry he's built with Kirk. And also, I think the Vikings are going to be behind quite a bit this year. So I think they're going to throw the football a lot. And I think Jefferson has a 2,000-yard year. Okay, that is uh, coming right out of the gate firing. I think his numbers are going to go down a little because they're going to throw it to other people. Uh, last year, it was Justin Jefferson, and I don't know if Adam Thielen can get open anymore, <laughs> at, right? And they weren't good at throwing screen passes. I think they want to do that. They weren't really good at like bootlegs and dumping off to the tight end. I, I, know that I think they want to do that, like use Josh Oliver a little. TJ Hawkinson just got paid. They, you're going to use him. And Jordan Addison, but Jordan Addison is the swing man to this because if he's good, you can throw it to him all the time too. If he struggles or he gets hurt or whatever, then it's right back to the Justin Jefferson entire offense. And I also think, and maybe just a, a quick detour, because I would love your opinion on this. Uh, I think what Jefferson and Hawkinson did with their contracts was different approaches. One did more of a hold in and the other one took every rep. I think you could compliment Jefferson by taking every rep Without criticizing Hawkinson, you can laugh at Hawkinson because the excuses were hilarious and weird. But for for the approach, 
I like I think it's okay if players are using everything they can to negotiate their contract. You only get so many of these. The owner's uh, team will still be worth billions and billions of dollars. If Washington's worth six billion, imagine what the other teams are worth. So I think that uh, you could say, hey, Justin Jefferson, how he handled this whole thing, nothing in the media whatsoever. Every rep in practice, I think it's been very impressive how he's gone about it. Yeah, I mean, he's a true pro, right? We've watched him grow from our eyes from when I used to say he was a light blue in our meter when we first talked about him. I was like, oh, I don't annoy rookies, kings, da da da. That dude's as red hot as they come anymore. And, you know, in it, and you see. I think people are still jaded by the Diggs era, right, of how he went about and handled things. And he's a fantastic player. I love Diggs to death, and he's a superstar. You know, but Jefferson's just gone about it in a completely different way, more of the humble approach. And that not being said that when he makes 200 and whatever million dollars in his next contract, things will change. But just I've loved the way he's approached everything from the offseason approach to how he goes throughout the year, how he takes care of his body, how he is in front of the media. All those things have been fantastic. You know, I watched them interview him during a preseason game and he was engaged. He was watching the game while he was doing the interview. And, you know, I think that that's a guy that you want as a leader on your football team for a long time, too. Yeah. And I mean, he's spoken to us and answered all the questions about the contract without, you know, saying anything to throw anybody under the bus or making any sort of outrageous statements or anything like that. And also from his side, there has been no leaks. And I think that's another thing, too, that they haven't tried to put pressure on the Vikings through the media or anything like that. I think handling it as down the middle as you can get. Uh, But anyway, 2000 yards would be insane. I am not ready to buy in fully to that because I think they have more weapons. But I but I love the take. Uh, What else you got? I think that the Jacksonville Jaguars end up with the second seed in the AFC. Wow. Second seed. Yes. If you look at that roster and you look at what they were able to do last year, I think the bills fall off a little bit this year. They're getting a little bit older. Their run game has been not very good. They lost some pieces of the O line too. I think that Jacksonville is primed in a division that is hot garbage ability to run their division, right? That's a lot of wins. And then they won their division. So they're gonna have some tough games, but win some of those tough games on the road. I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be a superstar this year. Evan Ingram, I think, is going to be one of the top tight ends in the league this year. You add Calvin Ridley. You have Christian Kirk. Christian Kirk. Like, there is so many weapons in ETN on that team. I think their offense is going to be outstanding. And if they can just continue to even be as good as they were on defense and not even get remotely better than they were last year, I think that they're a chance to have the second seed in the AFC. I mean, when you can start out like five and one uh, yeah. in your division, that's a pretty, I mean, that's quite different from if you're in the AFC East. And yes. I mean, even, even if Aaron Rodgers is disappointing, they're still way more competitive than they were last year. And uh, there's no reason to think Miami's not good. I would never count out a Belichick team, especially if he has an offensive coordinator who maybe <laughs> has a clue. Unlike <laughs> last year, they won some games with the worst offensive coordinator situation in the entire NFL, because I have no idea what Belichick was doing but they're still a competitive team. So if you're in that division or the West where Denver's probably getting a little bit better with Sean Payton, and uh, I would also throw this out there. I, I think that the Chargers would be a team that I might nominate for some time you're going to be right if you keep picking the Chargers. <laughs> so like last year, I was like, okay, they've got all the signs. They just got Khalil Mack. Here we go. And they're going to take that big jump. And of course they blew like a 27 point lead in the playoffs, but they were also really banged up. Mm -hmm. I think their offensive line is better. I think they're healthier. They've added a weapon in uh, Quentin Johnston. Like I, I think that if I'm picking the seeds that maybe they're a little higher than people think, and I would put them up there, maybe even a rematch with the Jaguars. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I I love the chargers. They can stay healthy. I mean, you talk about Joey Bosa, like Keenan Allen was hurt. Most of the year. Mike Williams was playing on one leg. Like, they were so beautiful. They lost Rashawn Slater, their all pro left tackle in the first game of the year. I mean, they have so many pieces too. The Chargers are another team that could be really, really good with Austin Eckler still being a fantasy legend, right? Doing what he can do. But I mean, the AFC, when you start to look into some of the teams, the AFC's top end is really, really good, but the bottom end is awful, right? It, it's, it's, it's a big drop off from like the top six teams in the AFC to the rest. Like it's, it's pretty bad. All right, here's the one that I'm going to put down on on paper that people can make fun of me later if it doesn't turn out. But in the National Football Conference, where 
it's just on fire. I, like <laughs> it's just, it, when you look at the AFC, it's like this beautiful castle, yeah. and then this is like the fixer upper that's on HGTV that they're walking in. They're like, we're going to got to take down that wall. Got to make it Oakley concept. Uh, got to put a fence out back. Like that's the NFC. I think Seattle's going to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. I, wow. I, I think that they're going to take, they're going to take this next step for them. That Geno Smith is going to be really good this year with their receivers, the same offense they've improved on defense and the NFC just does not, make me think there's too many other great teams. I mean, Philadelphia, it's very hard to get back to the Super Bowl two years in a row. San Francisco, can Purdy play the whole season? He's been banged up. Is he actually even any good? And those are the teams that everyone sort of anointed as the best. And then the Lions, who you can't really trust. So I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'm, I'm going out on a limb and I'm going to pick Seattle. I can, I just don't know if they can get past the 49ers. Like their tackles, so Seattle again. I'm gonna talk about the old lines. Their tackles, two young tackles, right? Lucas Abrams, Charles Cross, studs, right? But I wanted them to pick my second round pick because they need a starting center bad, and they didn't, right? But Gino, Gino Smith, can he lightning in a bottle two years in a row, right? It was kind of the resurgence of last year. Can he carry on that? Was that the best he's gonna be? Is he still getting better? I, he's the giant question mark, but I mean, you add Smith and Jigba to that receiving room of Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, scary, scary. Kenneth Walker, you add Zach Charbonnet, a second round pick running back. They have a ton of weapons too. It's just when you talk about a division against the 49ers, that's where I, I wonder if they're going to run in the roadblock of the 49ers because that defense didn't lose anything. Nothing. Right. Oh, uh, right. Uh, assuming that Bose is going to play, I yeah, figure, I mean, right? I mean, you have I, to guess. If he, you, have, you have to assume. If he, yeah, if he doesn't, then uh, it's a lot different. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen there. But uh, I the, the rest of the division, though, I mean, Arizona, that's two free wins. And uh, the Rams, uh, Cooper Cup's having some health issues, and they've got a uh, $7,000 dollar or seven million dollars what no it's much more like 70 80 million dollars in dead cap i i don't remember exactly the number it's like 80 million dollars so uh that's not good for them i think their roster is actually quite bad at the moment so you're in a division that's quite winnable uh who do you think is going to win the nfc north detroit i think you're buying i'm buying into detroit you know i think looking at it from an offensive line perspective, they have a top three offensive line in the all of college, all of college, all of the NFL when healthy, right? Taylor Decker, Penny Swool, Frank Ragnow. I mean, you talk about all pros at three positions, and you add Jameer Gibbs, who's going to be a very special talent. Amara St. Brown, one of the best receivers in the NFL. And then that defense is if they can pick up where they left last year, I mean, they were smothering last year. The last eight games of the year last year, they were smothering. I really worry about the Packers and Jordan Love. Anytime you have a new quarterback situation, not sure. Kirk and Kirk and the Fighting Vikings, I love them to death. I think our defense is going to have times it's going to struggle. Uh, we're going to score a lot of points, I think, but we did that last year. right? We did that last year, and it's hard to do it again twice. And I think Detroit runs away with it because I'm not buying into the Justin Fields. Everyone thinks he's going to take some giant jump in year two. I just I didn't see it last year. He ran like a running back. It's great for fantasy football, but he's going to get hurt if he tries to do that all year long. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I'm going to remain skeptical on both he and Jordan Love until we see it. And, you know, I, I think Love doesn't have a super high bar to play as well as Aaron Rodgers, and that team still has a lot of talent. But to me, it just sort of screams 500-style football team. And with Justin Fields, part of the bet that they made was that he could be bad, and they knew that if he's bad and they win five or six games, that they're going to be in position to draft one of these, I don't know, eight quarterbacks who are going in the first round at this right. point from uh, after watching week one. But the, the, that was part of the bet. So I think that we have to kind of wait and see on that. And, you know, if Fields does improve, it, even then, like, can he be good? Because it's not an improvement. You're talking about, like, that's the Ed Ingram thing. If he improves, you're hoping to get to below average at this point because it was one of the worst in the league. It's the same thing with Fields. 
if he takes a big step, it might be average. It's got to take, he's got to take an ungodly step to be actually good. So then does it even out with the running? I also think that football team is just not fully formed yet that they need one more off season to spend more of that cash and build the rest of the roster before they're a legitimate contender. Uh, Detroit, I, I have been very much waffling on Detroit uh, for the entire off season because they are still Detroit and you could you could still see a few things going wrong for them. The thing with Jared Goff is if his offensive line is good and healthy, that dude is a beast. He will sit back there and just, just throw passes all over the place. If they get banged up or they're, you know, not a little shaky, he struggles if he has to move at all. And that that's kind of a definitive factor of them and how they got behind last year. We'll have to see about the defense. It's supposed to be better. And everyone talks about Aaron Glenn as if he's great, but has not shown that at any point yet so far. So I'm a little skeptical that they could be great, but I think they'll be more neck and neck with the Vikings. How many wins do you have the Vikings getting? I've, I've gone back and forth on this one. You know, I want to say they're a 10 win team. I want to say that that's kind of the number, but I think it's probably more like eight or nine. I think it's probably more like eight or nine, just based off the fact of the pieces that we lost you know, trying to figure out how to replace that new coordinator on defense, some growing pains with some young players that are going to be asked to play a lot. I mean, you have an undrafted free agent starting at middle linebacker. Yes, he earned that. Did I think he was incredible in college when I've signed him? 100%. I thought he was a locked draft pick. I mean, he's as safe as a bet as you could have got as an undrafted free agent. But at the same time, he's a rookie play caller. He's, he's your signal caller. He's in the middle. Like, it, it's just bound to make mistakes. And you talk about – losing some depth pieces on the front on the defensive front you mean you start talking post starters people have question marks of like who is that who is that how long is he what has he done like you talk about guys getting banged up the nfl's a war of attrition i just don't think the vikings have enough depth on the defensive side of the ball to win football games late in the year when it matters and you got to get after it and guys are hurt vets are old i mean it's just hard to do in the nfl that's my biggest issue with the Vikings, just the, the the ability to have young players in really critical situations and then older players that are just low on the depth chart. Like that's my biggest thing that I think holds this team back. In a lot of instances, if you go one level down from the starter, you are into who is that territory. Uh, and I mean, especially a cornerback where if a Caleb Evans or Makai Blackman gets hurt, it's either elevate Jawan Williams from the practice squad who, you know, is Jawan Williams. And then Andrew Booth Jr., who has almost never played and didn't get a single first team rep as a former second round draft pick all the way throughout training camp. Like that's your starters if somebody gets banged up. And I think, you know, we're always going to kind of go back and reference the 2017 team because, you know, you were on it and I covered it. And when you look at some of the backups there, some of the guys coming off the bench, there was a lot of experienced players who were coming off the bench, guys who had developed over a number of years, whether they were like special teamers or the kind of Josh Metellus types or Anthony Harris types mm -hmm. where you knew that this player could step up if you absolutely needed him. And then there was even just depth players who were experienced like Brian Robinson, who is coming off the bench playing a role. But when Everson Griffin hurt his foot, I mean, you start B-Rob, that's an NFL starting defensive lineman who is in there when someone gets hurt. That is not what they have on this team. It is, okay, this guy's never played before, but we get to see his debut. Uh, that's pretty much every position except for receiver. Even at running back, it's if Alexander Madison gets hurt, uh, Miles Gaskin has played some football games before, but aside from that, pretty much nobody has. On the offensive line, you're talking about Blake Brandle. You're talking about... Oli Udo was very spotty in training camp, has some experience, but not great experience. So I think there's that's pretty much true for every spot. I went with 10 wins for the Vikings. I think it's fair when you have this good of a quarterback and this good of offense, but enough problems to see them having some really rough days on defense. They play Herbert. They play Mahomes. Uh, last thing, who is winning the Super Bowl? Who is your Super Bowl winning franchise? I think the Bengals get it done this year. I think the Bengals find a way to get it done this year. They've been so close. They bolstered up that offensive line, right? When I got Orlando Brown at left tackle, Kappa, obviously I'm a little biased. They have a good starting left guard and Cordell Volson, Ted Karras. And then this is kind of their last year too, because after this, you got to pay Jamar Chase. 
Can you still afford T. Higgins? Can you still pay Hendricks on the defensive side? Right? There's Hubbard. Like, there's a lot of Logan Wilson. There's a lot of guys that are on the cusp of becoming mega millionaires because of their play. It will be impossible to keep this team together after this year. So I think the Bengals are all in. If Joe Burrow can stay healthy, I think the Bengals end up winning it this year. Uh, that was actually my pick as well. That's That's been my pick kind of through the offseason. It just, it just feels like, and this was maybe true for a team like New Orleans. Sorry to bring this up for Vikings fans. But there's just been a number of times Peyton Manning with the Colts where a team was just knocking on the door, knocking on the door with a great quarterback and ended up finally breaking through. It seems like that's going to happen at some point for Burrow. But the AFC, very, very much uh, up for grabs. So I am excited. We have actual, real National Football League football Mm. this week. And by the way, those longtime listeners would remember your hunting trip where you have to miss a week. Usually that's week one. It's not this year. So we will be able to get your full breakdown of Vita Vea versus Garrett Bradbury. <laughs> and we'll see how that goes uh, in week one. So I'm excited. You're going to be here all season long. Yep. And uh, Tuesday morning guard is le- is back, baby. Let's go. Hey, absolutely. And I'm, I'm more I'm a, I'm a grown up now. I actually have it on my Google calendar. So I'll make sure we, we have it more of our Tuesday actual recordings. Not to say three kids doesn't throw a wrench in that sometimes. But I will try to be here on Tuesday as much as humanly possible. We've always made it work from hotel rooms, from airports at (laughs) times has uh, happened on numerous (laughs) occasions. So, yes, we will be doing this for sure. Uh, Thanks, Jeremiah. And I'm looking forward to another season with you, man. Absolutely. Me too, man.